the maps attached here um, yeah, on canvas uh, to the uh, posting in the same document as the video, as this lecture, uh, what, what will you see? Uh, in 19, say 19, uh, after 1989 in Central and Eastern Europe. What is the ethnic map of that, uh, uh, Central East? Right? You will see that basically there is almost no state in Central Eastern Europe that is a nation state, as it normally should be. Remember, even those states that consider themselves nation states in Western Europe, like France, they are now a nation state because they have eliminated the competing groups from inside or assimilated. Okay? So after 1989, you have, you know, communism was removed, but now we have democracy, right? We have democracy, and we have several, none of the, almost none of the states are a pure nation state, meaning ethnically defined pure, uh, the state doesn't include only this purely ethnically defined nation, of course, right? So they will have to deal with this idea of ethnic minorities. To complicate it even further, some of these states are actually federations, so actually they're not unitary states, remember the difference between unitary and federal. So, which means that they're constituted of several smaller administrative units, mostly arranged by uh, along national, ethno-national criteria. So, Czechoslovakia is constituted or, uh, in, from the Czech part and the Slovak part, which means that it's two administrative sections defined along ethnic, national, ethno-national criteria. That's, that's why it's federal, right? Uh, Yugoslavia is another one, of course, right? So all of these states will have to deal with, with, with the, the presence of different ethnic groups. Now, notice the difference between ethnic group and national group. Or ethnic group, uh, well, let's, let's use these expressions. Because simply an ethnic group <coughs> is a group of people united by different essential characteristics, language, religion, uh, culture, traditions, whatever, whatever, right? And that makes them an ethnic group. Now, this ethnic group uh, becomes a national group when they also claim statehood, when they also claim sovereignty, they also claim political self-governance. Let's, let's put it that way. Okay, that's the differentiation. That's a major difference between nation and nation uh, or national group and and uh, ethnicity uh, purely. Because there are ethnic groups around the world that do not claim self-governance, although more and more uh, uh, do. Okay, so, uh, so, but in Central Eastern Europe, given the history of the region, most of these ethnic groups are also national groups. Most of these ethnic groups, because all of the states were, were formed as a result of uh, ethnically defined nations claiming statehood, that's how all of these states were formed, basically. This is why the Austrian Empire fell apart. Right? Um, then, after 1989, when suddenly they're free to express their identity, and you don't want to oppress them, right, from expressing their identity, they will claim a measure of self-government, right? And what will result here is, are several strategies, are several strategies, because, uh, which will give different, which will yield uh, different uh, uh, results. So, um, what, since all of these nations are multi-ethnic, all, all of the states, sorry, all these states are multi-ethnic, right? In many ways, multinational, but let's just stick with multi-ethnic, right? The question will become, how will this multi-ethnicity be dealt with, right? Be dealt with. And there will be several uh, strategies. The most, the first and most basic one is claiming self-governance. So how do you apply the democratic principle in a multi-ethnic state? That's the question, that's an essential question of Central Eastern Europe. And this is why I insisted to, to, uh, to, for us to discuss the Austro-Hungarian Empire, because it was an attempt to solve this problem, okay? And we all saw what happened. So uh, self-governance, right? I mean, this is the essence of the democracy. We need to govern ourselves for our own interests, but who is we? So, one of the strategies to solve the problem would be self-governance, in which mostly ethnic minorities, say, the Hungarian, uh, ethnic Hungarian minority in Slovakia, right, uh, will, within the state of Slovakia, right, 
which has, uh, we all know how Slovakia was formed, it used to be, that was lands part of the Hungarian kingdom, whatever, when we, they redrew drew the, the, the borders of Hungary, there resulted large ethnic Hungarian ethnic minorities outside of the current borders of Hungary, of course, because you just redrew the borders. Well, there is this large ethnic minority in, in Slovakia. Self-governance means the, the demand to govern themselves. For example, you have a region, and this can be administrative, in which you have a region, a county that has 99% ethnic Hungarian within Slovakia. So here's Slovakia, and here it's 99% Hungarian. They will claim to the right to govern themselves in Hungarian, use the language in administration to govern themselves based on the fact that it's an ethnic, you know, it's a national ethnic group there, and so on. Right? Administration. But it's also what your book nicely calls the uh, institutions of cultural reproduction. So cultural, cultural self-governance. And this, re this relates especially to schools. Now, notice, remember that in all these countries, uh, the school systems are state-run. Right? Are state-run. So the school system is funded by everyone, run by uh, the state, that's how the things work. And this is why it's also free for everyone, including higher education. But if it's run by everyone, paid for everyone, and run for everyone, right, then they should also provide it in the language of everyone. So you need institutions of education, grade school, high school, uh, higher education in your own language. Because you are still a citizen of the same state, you need to get the same benefits. Now all, this becomes a problem, but because here it becomes a, an issue of separation and uh, this national definition and competing nationalisms and so on. How can we let them study their own language and they will not speak the other language? Does this sound familiar? Okay. So, but anyway, cultural self-governance and initiative self-governance going as far as autonomy. Autonomy which was not achieved by any of the entities here which is not secession. Autonomy simply means uh, autonomous, uh, in the, you know, separate self-governance, but still within the state. You have your sphere of autonomy within the state. It's a complicated term, doesn't work because it gets, as you see, too close to questioning the sovereignty of the state. And sovereignty means, again, exclusive control over a territory. So when someone claims autonomy, it puts into question that exclusive exclusiveness of a control of the state. So that's one strategy, self-governance. Now this has been achieved, self-governance within the existing state. Within the existing state. Okay? So within the existing state. Now this has been a strategy mostly pursued through um, peaceful means, through political means, and the example I gave in the ethnic Hungarians in Slovakia is one, ethnic Hungarians in Romania is another one, and so on. They formed their own ethnic political parties, com competed in elections or participated in elections, and you know, negotiated with governments or parts of the government, and they could pass such policies. So democratic means, and remember, politics is the solution to, is the only alternative to violence. Using politics means that these conflicts that are inherent are there, these conflicts are there, this, this, this debate is there, whether you want it or not. Uh, you, the question is how you solve it. If you use the, use the means of politics, it means that you don't solve it in the street through violence, violent conflict. Right? Um, let, let, also me, let me also note, note besides administration, culture, also representation. Let me also list this. And by representation, I mean uh, the fact that in various countries uh, in the region, all of them have ethnic groups, right? Because all of them have ethnic groups, and because they come out of communism, they were made, in most of these countries, they made sure that the, the constitution provides for special representation for the ethnic groups there, so they're not oppressed or eliminated as, you know, during communism, right? So representation means that in many countries in this, in this region, you will have in parliament seats reserved for members of the ethnic groups. So you will have in Slovenia a seat for Hungarian ethnic group, a seat for Croatian ethnic group, and so on. Especially when the ethnic groups are small, this works. Okay? The point is the principle of representation, that you need to make sure that in a population that uh, um, all are represented. And this principle of 
the this principle of representation results in reserved seats, especially in the countries where the ethnic groups are too small and they would not would not be able to win seats on their own if you don't give them reserved them seats. The point is protecting, ensuring this principle of representation. But this is still part of self-governance. The idea that these ethnic groups try to achieve to protect their cultural uh, interests, to, to protect their identity, to manifest their national identity through the means of self-government in administration, and that usually means local government, cultural uh, self-governance or cultural rights, meaning that the, 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 the right to, to live and express themselves and learn and study and manifest themselves, for example, in, in cultural uh, institutions in their own language. And I mentioned the example of you know, Timisoara in Romania, which has national theaters, which means that state state-funded theaters in different languages, and they have been around for for many for a long time, right? And they're different institutions but in different languages. Uh, and or representation in the government. So self-governance is one of the tools and it's self-governance within the existing state. Now if this fails, right, this is this response to the principle of democracy. If this fails, the only thing remaining is secession, or so it seems. And secession is the term that means, you know, <coughs> a redrawing of the boundaries of, of the state, a breaking away of one territory from a state. Now this is one of the, uh, let me put it this way, it always results in violence. And it always results in violence because the modern state is a jealous thing, is a jealous god. It, it is sovereign, it does not accept for secession. Again, if yes, then let's let Florida leave. Let's let Miami leave because they all speak Spanish. Oh no, you can't. Why? Right? It's this idea that, you know, it's absolute. It's, uh, it's, it's this thing, it cannot let go. It cannot let go of any part. Right? So the attempt to secede, think civil war in the United States, the attempt for this part to secede usually gives rise to conflict. But secession happens when the political means of self-government, of self-representation, of protecting national identity have failed, and or when the process of nation, nation and state building is actually, has never been uh, finished, or has never been taken uh, to one stable conclusion. And the example I'm going to give, which to talk for you to understand very simply, is Yugoslavia or Czechoslovakia. Both Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia are sort of war, sort of halfway creations between the beginning of the process of nation and state building in the 19th century, right, and what is the, uh, you know, sort of a theoretical goal that each nation needs to have its state. And notice, these are halfway houses, because they didn't get there. Now, should they get there, can they get there, is that possible, is that feasible, is that normal, it's a whole different story. But, the modern process of nation state building is so powerful that it wipes away all rivals in front of it. And again, need I give again the example of the United States? Uh, so it's not foreign, that's my point here. Right? It's not something, oh, there's some savages who do this. Every state has done this. Okay? Um, so secession happens, happened, for example, in former Yugoslavia or in the former Czechoslovakia, because these were halfway houses, they never achieved that. So, in Czechoslovakia, you have a secession by splitting the country into, as your book mentions, right, from, uh, into two parts, and it was non-violent, it was peaceful, it was a velvet divorce, it, because, for many reasons, which it, the book goes over, so I'm going to repeat that, but including the fact that meanwhile in Yugoslavia there were wars and they didn't want to have that. But also because the national group here and the national group here, the boundaries of ethnically defined nation and the boundaries of the existing administrative borders, because it was already made of a Czech part and a Slovak part, kind of coincided. So you didn't have a large slow this is a Czech part, this is a Slovak part. You didn't have a large Slovak population here and a large Czech population here that would make problems. Because then you couldn't draw, if this would be the case, then you would have to draw a border including these, but then you would include also Slovak, so now you see the proof. So that was very important, that was very important that, that, that the, the historical boundaries between these different cultural groups, uh, you know, were fairly well delineated. So they could claim uh, whatever separate state. Not in Yugoslavia, not in Yugoslavia as you all well know. 
because there was no way to draw such clear lines. So secession just resulted into to competing ethnic nationalisms, in which the only thing to do was to uh, endeavor what? Ethnic cleansing. And here's another term that I want you to know, ethnic cleansing, which is not the same as genocide. Ethnic cleansing is, as the name implies, the, the removal of a certain ethnic group from a territory. And that removal can be, you know, through killing them, eliminating them, or just to force, force uh, evacuation, forced migration. Stalin has done that with many populations <coughs> during communism. Uh, the banished decrees after uh, in Czechoslovakia after in, during communism have forcefully moved millions of people out of the country, Hungarians and Germans and so on, based on ethnic criteria. Ethnic cleansing was tried by Milosevic in Kosovo. They, you know, 700,000 people were moved out of their territory. They tried to clean the area of a specific ethnic group. Some of them by killing them, some of them by chasing them out. That's ethnic cleansing. Genocide is a different term, and it has two roots here. Genos, which is a genus, which is a group, uh, a group united by the same identity and side, which is killing. So it's basically the mass killing of a group based on certain identity characteristics, right? And it needs to be mass, and it needs to be a group related by certain uh, identity characteristics such as, you know, race, uh, ethnicity, and so on. So uh, a large uh, killing per per perpetrated in order to eliminate a specific ethnic, racial, whatever other identity group. Uh, sometimes ethnic cleansing can go into genocide, sometimes part of genocide is ethnic cleansing, but notice that it's not the same term. Right? Good. Well, not so good things. Uh, but back to secession. And notice that secession actually happened, right, both in Yugoslavia and in Czechoslovakia, right? Uh, we can consider Czechoslovakia a, a form of peaceful secession, right? Uh, agreed, agreed and negotiated while Yugoslavia was a violent cycle of uh, several secessions. So that's a, that's a, but notice that in both these cases, you know, we're talking about federal, uh, federal, uh, uh, formerly federal states that, uh, from which uh, uh, other states see. And you're, we don't discuss the Baltic states, but that was also the case with the Baltic states versus the United States, the USSR. So that's the second sort of an outcome of after 1989. One is uh, self-governance, so different attempts of administrative self-governance, cultural self-governance, and rights, uh, uh, representation uh, in uh, uh, self-governance to representation in the national institutions of uh, government. So self-governance as a solution to a multi-ethnic society in a democracy. The other one was, and not lacking in many problems, the other one was secession, simply each of these ethno-national groups claiming their own state. A third tool was, well, let's call it, um, uh, let's say, uh, dominance. Now, this can take many forms. Assimilation, uh, denial of rights, uh, uh, you know, oppression, whatever. But the point is that it's, it's uh, another strategy through which in a state, let's say, we gave the example of Slovakia, in Slovakia, the majority ethnic groups tries to eliminate the claims, uh, uh, kind of forcefully integrate the Hungarian minority. I'm giving an example. This is, you know, just a theoretical example, although it might have reflections in reality uh, or not. Um, dominance means forceful assimilation, integration. This can and, and the state can use uh, cultural policies to do that, economic policies, uh, or think of the Roma minority. Gypsies, Roma, right? Minority. Uh, that's, that's another ethnic group present throughout these countries. Uh, so, forceful assimilation, integration, and the effort here is to create what? A unitary nation state. And that's the problem, because they are, the, the attempt is to create a unitary nation state in, a, in an actual situation which is not nation state. So you're trying to force recreate it. Now, understand, this has been the strategy used by many states around the world when they were formed. France is an example that I gave you, right? <coughs> Forcefully, you're going to be French. United States is another example. 
because no competing claims were accepted. Civil war was another example where you know, oh, you want to do your own state? No, you won't. Okay. Forget that we, excluding now the issue of slavery or not, because there was a national issue that was very important. Okay, um, so creating a unitary nation state in a, in a in an actual state that is not nation state, and unitary means that you don't give them self. Uh, it's not federal. Because if you do it with federal, you could make a different province here just for the Hungarians and so on. So unitary means no one government and all of them of the Slovak nation, but hey, they're Hungarians. Now notice that this is the same problem that took place in the 19th century in the Hungarian kingdom, when the Hungarian kingdom tried to do the same thing to the Slovaks. So here's, here's the Hungarian kingdom, and you had Slovaks, and you have Romanians, and you had Serbs, and you had Germans, and they tried to what? Assimilate them, dominance. Now guess what? After the peace, the Treaty of Trianon, after World War I, here's the new Hungary. And now you have Hungarian minorities here, 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 and here. And now they're suffering the reverse. Which, which points out to the other thing, also mentioned in your book, that a lot of these that competing nationalisms have to do with past grievances. But it's a cycle of grievances. You did this to my grandfather. No, no, your grandfather did this, and then your father did this, and it's back and forth and back and forth. Okay. So dominance is another... So basically creating, integrating the minorities into the larger, uh, into, into the unitary uh, nation state. And it's a problematic thing. Assimilation, integration, right? And then there's the strategy of expansion, which doesn't mean expanding borders. Right? We're talking about people who we move from secession. Expansion, I mean expanding, here's the interesting thing. You don't, ex since in the modern world, the change of borders in the world of nation states, in the world of states, of sovereign states, is one of the most, uh, uh, you know, rejected, the most, uh, uh, I mean, if you try to do that, that makes you a pariah in the international system. And since the UN was established, the United Nations, it was built on this principle of sovereign borders, of the fact that states should not try to change borders, because they know, you know, these are all, all states have armies, when you try to change borders, war erupts. So changing borders is the worst thing, the most, uh, you know, one of the greatest causes of conflict. Secession, it immediately comes, it gets to war. Other things can be managed, but secession gets to war because states have armies. And they're jealous of their, you know, okay, try to secede if you want. Try to secede in the, uh, you know, Cascadia. You'll see what happens. Uh, expansion, so you see, you don't, can't change borders, right? Here are the borders, current borders, and the international conventions are keep the borders as they are, so that we have less wars, because otherwise it never ends. Because you defeat them now, they're going to come back and so on. This has been the history of Europe. Uh, expand, what can you expand? Since you cannot expand territory, right, except for war, Yugoslavia, no one that. You can expand, interestingly, the definition of the nation, or rather, to strengthen the definition and the bounds of nation. What sort of nation? Not state-defined, but ethno-culturally defined. And I'm going to expand, I'm going to expand, I'm going to explain how this works. So here's Hungary. And there are hundreds of thousands of Hungarians here, 1.6 million here in Slovakia, in Romania, some in Yugoslavia, some in Croatia. So you have Hungarians here, 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 and here. But this is the state of Hungary, these are other states. You can change the borders, you don't want to change the borders, you don't want conflict, no war, but you want to protect the interests of the nation. A nation that is defined as the culture. So what you do is you strengthen the bounds of the nation. Bounds are what? Ethno culture. So you sponsor cultural institutions for these or, or that would connect these the nation. You help their struggle with the local government, with the whatever state government in Romania, in Slovakia, you help them claim their cultural rights. You lobby for them. You actively step in with international institutions to support their interests in all these countries. And you can go even farther. You can give them specific rights that only the citizens of the Hungarian state have. You give them to ethnic Hungarians abroad. And that's not absurd. Because that's the same thing that Germany did to ethnic Germans abroad. Many of these policies were used by them non-controversially. Okay. 
So you expand with the use of the fact that you have a state in Hungary, your own sovereign state, you strengthen the, the cultural, ethno-cultural, and why not, political bonds with ethnic Hungarians from abroad. But you don't change the borders. You don't. So it's trans-sovereign, as your book puts it, trans-sovereign, trans-border, cross-border nation building. You see that this is nation building, not state building. You see the difference? Because what you're building is the nation. And what you want to ensure is the survival of the nation defined culturally. Although the borders are here. Because the nation as an entity transcends the existing state borders. And what the Hungarian government did finally, the most recently, uh, and we're going to talk when we talk about Hungary, but I'm just pointing forward, uh, it was that it gave the right, telling them to stay where they are, and you know, I mean, these are people who have always lived here, right? We talked about how, you know, why there is, uh, you know, what's the explanation for the whole situation? Uh, <clears throat> what they did is to give them the right even to vote in Hungarian elections, which is a right that only citizens, meaning only the members of the state usually have, but here's the state, here are the, here's the borders of the state, okay? For citizens of the state, we as, this is why it's important to understand that the state is a set of institutions with sovereign power over territory and membership. Because here's my state, Hungary. So I have sovereign power over this territory. But it's my power to define who is the member of the state. But what if I give membership in the state to all ethnic Hungarians in Romania? Well, guess what? This thing has been done by many. Paul, you can, if your grandfather was Italian, you can claim Italian citizenship and that gives you membership in the Italian state. You'll be a member of Italy. You'll be an Italian citizen. Okay? And it might have been only your grandfather. Poland does the same thing. There are many countries, Spain does the same thing. But here it's more, more complicated because, because the groups are in neighboring states, are large, and the neighboring states have policies of dominance, of assimilating, well, or have policies. There have been governments who had such policies in these neighboring states. Plus there's a historical relationship of conflict, of national self-definition that is competitive. That the Slovaks define their nation, national identity in opposition to Hungarian state, uh, you know, attempts at dominance, just like the Romanians in Transylvania define their national identity against the attempts from the then Hungarian kingdom to assimilate them. So there's that historical legacy of grievances. So now these policies of the Hungarian government to give membership in the state to people who are not within the borders, which is their, you know, it's their. Clearly, we're not welcome, uh, you know, with joy by the, some of these neighboring states. But that's another, we can call it expansion, we can call it, you know, strengthening, well, nation building. Expansion of the nation or nation building. Not state building, but nation. So, we, thus I went briefly over four strategies of dealing with the fact that after 1989, you have a Central Eastern European region of multi-ethnic states. Almost all of them, few are more homogenous, like Hungary itself, inside, is <laughs> homogenous. Uh, Czech, Czech Republic is homogenous, but even there you have sizable Roma population that, you know, are, are, are neglected when we talk about this, because the Roma, guess what, they don't have a mother state to appeal for them. So that's a, you know, 1989, after you have Central Eastern European uh, region where all of the states are to a degree multi ethnic, some of them federal. And now in this transition to democracy, uh, each, in each of these uh, regions, each of these states, the, the solution found to the situation of multi ethnic states will be, will be different. But here's the irony. Conclude with this: that we talked about the Austro-Hungarian Empire and how the breakdown of the Austro-Hungarian Empire was the result of competing nationalisms and the attempts to, you know, nation and state building processes. And it was a multinational state, and it crumbled because each nation wanted their own state. But what resulted were also multi-ethnic, multinational states, and uh, with their own conundrums. And that's still the situation.
Okay.